Hey, uh, welcome and God bless you. What's up? My name is Nate. I am the headmaster of the academy. A school I helped get started 15, 16 years ago in Oklahoma City. So we're a three campus Christian school of classics in Oklahoma City. We have sort of two K-8 feeders that feed a downtown, midtown, urban high school um, with about 830 students. I think we may we may get to almost 900 next year. I, you, are you guys experiencing growth at record rates? Okay. I figured we were not even close to being the only ones, but um, it's it's actually quite overwhelming. It's completely overwhelming. But um, anyway, God bless you. Thanks for coming to talk about eros. You know what I'm up against. I mean, I've got my talk. You know what the, what word is not in the New Testament? <laughs> eros. So I'm giving an entire talk without any New Testament backing whatsoever as a priest. Uh, so um, we'll, we'll see where it all goes, and I'll, I'll try to make my case. Here we go. Two and a half years ago, I, this is a funny, this starts heavy, it gets, there's a funny moment. Two and a half years ago, three years ago now, it's almost three years now. I sat in yet another ICU with my then 13-year-old second-born son. He was recovering from open-heart surgery, valve replacements, metal vaulting of his chest, release finally for his little bitty lungs, and we were met with this new problem. His pain management cocktail, I kept calling it a cocktail, kind of needed a cocktail at that moment, um, had left him uh, quite immobile and very confused for several days. Like he, his mom would be right in his face and he'd be yelling for his mom. It's like, clearly we're not, we're not getting the pain management uh, uh, right. With chest tubes painfully in place to drain the interior wound, we needed him to begin walking uh, lest a myriad of problems begin to take place. So crying out for his mom and with me, a dad, pacing the room, a solutions-oriented dad, and I can't fix it, and I can't fix it, so I'm pacing, I'm pacing. My mind raced back to um, St. Peter's Basilica. We had just visited the month prior in view of a, a pilgrimage we were going to do with our students. And uh, in the course of walking into the Basilica there at the Vatican, I had really had some rather uncontrollable emotion at the very sight of Michelangelo's beautiful Pieta. And I think because I was thinking a lot about my kid, and there's Mary holding her kid uh, in this beautiful uh, single block of marble that he had so perfectly sculpted. And so the, the, in the choir singing mass there, right over the grave of St. Peter, right, his crypt is just beneath the altar and so on. And so... Anyway, I'm, I'm reflecting on, on, on that. I'm pacing the room. My son is acting crazy, and he, he's not healing. When it hit me, um, it struck me. Honor, his name's Honor, uh, has an unusual and very misguided love of pop music. He has the worst musical tastes, this little heart patient. <laughs> And I knew that his favorite band, AJR, had just posted tickets for a fall show the week prior. Are your kids listening to AJR? You guys? Okay, somebody give me an amen here. Okay. I sat down on the end of his hospital bed, looked again at the tower of bags and pumps next to him, just pumping his little body and said, Honor, if you get out of this bed right now and walk, I will buy AJR tickets for you and for me and for anyone else who would want to go. My wife's eyes are like, okay, this, this is next level. Uh, that's how profound this priest's spiritual insight is. This is what I've been reduced to. Um, like Lazarus, excuse me, Lazarus, who was once dead, honor owned the pain. As I quickly unplugged each pump, they, they have battery backups. These pumps, you've seen these pumps, man, you know. 
they beep every hour on the hour. Anyway, um, he sat up I just over in a matter of minutes, threw his legs over the edge of the bed and attempted to use those same legs for the first time in a week. And for AJR, <laughs> he walked all the way to the nurse's station on the other side of the ICU and back again as his mom wept AJR tears for her little boy. And anyway, so months later, we stood in line half a mile. <laughs> there were so many people for AJR, at the Criterion, which is the, uh, the Bricktown music scene of OKC with a group of academy kiddos that he'd invited. I'm out however many hundreds of dollars getting this kid to, uh, and family members ready for the Neo Theater. That was their album at the time. Welcome to the Neo Theater. So, uh, and once in, Honor headed for the stage while I hung back with my quieter spirit, his little sister Esther, her first concert. She's sizing it up. Well, the opening song, which we knew only too well for, from Honor's horrible Spotify playlist, uh, hit me for the first time. And here, here are the lyrics. I'm kind of scared to drop this album. Let's push it back another week. Because I want to be next up forever. Find a way to never hit my peak. I kind of wish I was still a virgin. Time, time to finally see what sex is like. I want to be next up forever. Forever, I'll be second in line. Next up forever, second. This is my imagination. This is how it looks and sounds. But I got to go so much bigger so they can never shut me down. I'm kind of scared of graduation. I can just hear the song, dude. Dun, dun. There's lightning bolts going off in the screen. Oh, it's so good. Esther's blown away. I'm kind of scared of graduation. Because who am I when this is done? I want to be next up forever, so the best is always yet to come. That's their whole opening song. And so I'm saying, oh my gosh, this is some bizarre, corrupted form of eros. That's what I'm listening to. The form of love, of course, the Greeks would always hold closest to deification. Eros was deified, um, was sort of thrown in my face. Even, in, even if in this weird, corrupted way. So the talk today is an attempt to convince you to maybe lay, again, lay it to heart once again as your personal pedagogy. Um, this thought that Eros might pave the way to agape. Agape is the word in the New Testament for love. But what I found, here's, here's maybe my thesis, and we're, already, we're already here at the end. It is very hard for a child to go from zero to agape. It's very hard for a child to go from zero to total self-sacrificial love for neighbor. And era seems to pave the way. It seems to connect those dots. So agape, the highest form of Christian love, of course that's our personal paideia, our personal pedagogy, right? Um, so love. Love is the only reason that any school exists, that my school exists, that your school exists. Everything is comprehended in love. So that's what I want to sort of lead out with this. Conjugations are comprehended by love, statistics, literature, the hard sciences, the mastery of three languages, syntax, disobedient children, 504 plans, trust-based relational intervention, travel, uniforms, your worst days, your bad attitudes, I've got a lot of that. COVID-19, vaccination controversies, wasn't that a fun ride this year? That was my favorite. Uh, homework, feasts, matins, that's our morning prayer. Lessons and carols, that's our Christmas uh, uh, service. All of it exists because of love. It is perfected in love. It leads us to love. And it exists as the lineaments of a Christ who is the beginning and ending of everything. All of it is taken up into the one undivided trinity, fully comprehended for the good of your students and the glory of God. And so there's nothing else going on in your classrooms at all, dear friend. There's nothing at all. There's nothing else going on other than uh, uh, a student and a 
a, a teacher's engagement with love itself. All is love. So, to get us there today, you would, you, of course you know this, I, I have to rely heavily upon Joseph Pieper, whose lectures on love from Ignatius Press are the sort of work on this project. Um, this, and he really, he, he's the one that went after the reconnection of Eros and Agape. Uh, St. Augustine, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, their works on love, of course, are also looming everywhere in my talk, and you should read, you should read Bernard every year. Uh, his treatise on love is just remarkable. So go, go Bernard, go Bernard, go team, go team, I don't know, patristics. Uh, so good. Um, by the way, as academically accurate as I want this talk to be, right, I'm a, I'm a solid frustrated intellectual. I want to come off smart. I, I, do, I did choose the irreverent opening on purpose, right, AJR. Uh, for those of you who do not teach teenagers, <laughs> have yet to raise a teenager who finds such references as appropriately distasteful, I offer this talk as a challenge to you all as well. Either Christ descended into hell or he didn't. Which is to say, either love has something to say about everything, even though, well, and therefore we can fear nothing, or let's all pack up, let the world win already. I sort of want to know what redemption has to say about everything, what the world thinks its present wisdom is, and then what my students are invariably thinking about um, as they sort of inch out into the abyss of the world and the flesh and the devil, that good prayer book trifecta. So this, this talk is 100% a formal version of a dozen convos I've, I've had informally with my own kid. You wanna go to AJR? Let's go to AJR. Like I'm all in, let's go to AJR, let's, let's, let's go. Let's go find Jesus even there. We found Eros, so we have a discussion about Eros and this weird song about wishing he was still a virgin, right? Let's go find Jesus there. We found him in Rome. We found him in hell. We found him on a cross. We found him with a prostitute rubbing his feet with her gorgeous hair. We found him with cursing fishermen. We found him with the devil himself in a Lenten wilderness. A blessed and holy Lent to all of you, by the way. Don't say it. Happy Lent. Happy Lent. It's not, it's not wrong, wrong adjective. Unholy Lent. A blessed Lent. Okay, anyway. Sorry, a, a little priesting soapbox there, but... Um, we found him with the devil himself in a wilderness, not unlike your own life. I bet he's got something to say about this as well, such as love, because the world is drowning in it. The world's drowning in love. We fear nothing but the loss of thee, says the old prayer in my prayer book. Um, nothing, that same prayer, preserve us from faithless fears and worldly anxieties, says that same old prayer. And you can find that prayer in the 1928 prayer book or the 1979 prayer book, whichever your, any Episcopalian Anglicans in the room who know all these prayer book intramurals, okay. Either one, you can get that prayer. That prayer is available to you today in either of your prayer books. <laughs> right, we'll, we'll save that for Episcopal convention. That would be, we'll get more laughs there. <laughs> um, and then that same prayer says, and grant to us that no shadow of this mortal life will hide from us the light of thy love, which is immortal, says that same old prayer. And of course, that love is precisely the person of Jesus. Now, as many of you know, Greek uses four different words for love. So here we go. Let's kind of weigh it in. And I'm guessing that many of you are aware of C.S. Lewis's work on the same, the four loves. And perhaps that I think that was, I, I certainly read that before I read Peeper. So maybe that, I'm guessing that was my um, own introduction into this great discussion, The Four Loves. Let's go read it. It's remarkable. Uh, just remarkable. I don't, so I don't have time to get into all of them today, The Loves. I, I'm discussing two. So go read the book. Go read the book for the others. And I'm picking on Eros for two reasons today. Uh, perhaps... Beauty is what unites the two. That's sort of just occurring to me. But 
First, the huge misunderstanding surrounding the word, right? People think it's code word for sex. And so let's, let's do a little work there. And then secondly, because I think it's critical to the success of our schools. Uh, I, really, I really do. We'll, we're going to define it here in a second. Um, okay. I said this earlier, going from zero to agape, uh, agape often called the supernatural love or the infused love or the love of final Christian virtue, agape, is going from zero to that is not only daunting, but it's not necessarily the final Christian strategy in discipleship, I don't think. Uh, if so, I'm guessing certain books of the Bible and certain reference would be absent from the Bible. And then you have to think about that. If this book was absent from the Bible, what would be absent from my full and complete understanding of who God is and all that he has done and all that he has made? And so I've, I try to think those thoughts sometimes. If, so if Song of Songs is absent from the Holy Scripture, Holy Writ, what becomes my vision of uh, the one holy and undivided and blessed Trinity and all that that same Trinity has made and done in this world? And it's just an interesting thought exercise. It's fun to think about that with your kiddos as well as you teach. Uh, I take all of it for granted. And sometimes you need to think about, shoot. I would think, I would think very different thoughts. But anyway, going from zero to agape is not only daunting. I just don't know that it's necessarily the final uh, Judeo-Christian strategy and discipleship. There are steps along the way, you might say. And it, at least one reason for us re-strategizing is sort of my one cultural fear. I'm not one who tends to fear the things that we typically call the culture wars. I mean, clearly. I went to one of the worst pop concerts in Oklahoma City this morning. I'm being so mean to AJR. I did have fun at the concert. I might go again. Um, so I'm, I'm not typically frazzled by all the sexual mayhem around us. I am concerned about it. I'm just not frazzled. Identity politics, critical race theory, white fragility, gender dysphoria, QAnon, modesty controversies, those are a fun thing. Um, or the immigration policies that probably haunt even my youngest son's um, past. I have a kid who, um, we, a couple kiddos that we've adopted there, but... I mean, those things are unbelievably important, but they are all a product of something much more insidious, I fear. So my fear is rooted. So again, why I'm coming at kids, I'm trying to cultivate how to perpetuate a desire for perpetuated proper desire. That seems to be Eros's ongoing gift. There's something cyclic about Eros. There's something undying about Eros. Um, and you can speculate what happens to it in, in, in the new heavens and the new earth when we shall see him face to face. But anyway, so if, if, Eros is, if I'm sort of playing with how do I perpetuate, does it, you, what's the opposite of the proper desire for perpetuating proper desire? So I have to police that for my own children a little bit. I have to cultivate that in hopes that someday it'll be self-cultivated, not as, as given by the Spirit, and of course, um, and is offered. But uh, so yeah, I, so I could, I could spend my times in absolute paralysis over what we're going to do with CRT, critical race theory, or, or whatever, right? I, my parents bring this stuff to me. Like, what are we going to do? Where's the policy? I didn't see the policy in the handbook on that. The, the, so all those things are important, but they're all a product of something much more insidious my fear is rooted in this. What's the opposite of Eros? May maybe it's acedia. Um, just total apathy. Total disinterestedness. I, that seems to be what preys on my kids at my school, is indifference. I seem to be fighting a battle with total indifference. E even to the faith. Uh, so I, I we can get all up in arms about some of that other stuff. We want to teach proper and good and biblical and godly things on all of those, all of those, all of those, all of those. But I kind of want to know what my back is up against as I strategize with children and choose strategic loves to get me there. And I fear that apathy or disinterestedness, what super fussy cool books call acedia, may be where we're losing some of the battle. Which is to say the opposite of love is not hate, it's total indifference. 
total indifference. So if we graduate indifferent students, we lose. We lose. Even if they've got the worldview memorized and the bullet points accordingly and how to get there. Like, all right, I'm going to start with this ontological argument. Um, if, if we lose the love, the love battle, if, which is to say if we graduate indifferent students, we lose. We, we lose not only the comparatively insignificant, I, you know what I mean? Like this whole year, all I've done is fundraise for a whole year. And then you think, and this whole time I need to be chasing after Eros and Agape. What am I? We've got to build buildings. We've got to do the thing. Go team 10 million. Um, that, I, I lose that whole battle. I lose 18 months of my, my fundraising life if, if I lose the, the, the battle, the desire battle. Like, why, what do we do it all for? What was the whole point? Those things really, really plague senior administrators. Like, what am I, where should I park my time? So my, my current attack plan to, for all of this is Eros, love. And so I'm sort of pray that you'll, you'll um, join me. So here we go. Here's what I find unrealistic and exaggerated at the moment that I face my six-year-old, Ian James Michael, which is this, that the only love available to Christians is pure unselfishness. Have you ever met a six-year-old? Just goes from zero to pure unselfishness with this child. That's my strategy. Most selfish human being on the planet. I I had Ian as everything. Was a sexual. The unquestionable, unselfish elements of love are rooted in something more complex than mere unselfishness as we typically understand it. And so we need to go there as educators. Our school's mission names affections. We seek to shape students' affections as part of our mission which hint at some of the contemplative or maybe passive nature of love. Not that that contemplation is mere passivity, um, but the contemplative meditative aspects, the the, the affect, uh, the heart, you know, the, our own mission names affections, for example, well, the instinctual is perhaps better understanding, the instinctual, that's what I want to say. I skipped a line in my notes. The instinctual is perhaps a better understanding. How do we shape students who are so well predisposed to love that they effortlessly, hang with me, so to speak, just fancy the right things. I'm after their fancy as an educator. I want them to fancy the right things. And sometimes you got to go to the AJR concert to get that conversation. I'm kidding. I want them to fancy the right things. Those are a, those are affections, a soul wired in such a way that all of the right things are of immediate interest or of natural interest. I at least want to get it to second nature if I can't get it to first nature, right? I'm, it's a strategy with a child. I mean, it's going to, it's going to be in the basement of their soul if it's there at all when they, when they fall into your little family, into your little classroom. Right? Getting it to second nature, to first nature, to, to the instinctual, to the fancy. I want them to fancy the right things. So that's what I'm after today, and I think Eros can, can get us there. So let's, let's define Eros from the great Nate Carr Dictionary. Eros is that love which perpetuates the proper desire for continued proper desire. <laughs> no good. Eros is that love which perpetuates the proper desire for continued proper desire. Right? Yay, cyclic definitions. Um, we'll unpack that in, in you know, a little more. The, so the personal benefit, what's in it for the person? Eros kind of has some of that. It's got a... Eros is taking care of its individual. So it's self-oriented in a way that we, perhaps as Christians, should be a bit suspicious. I'm I'm pretty sure I was told love of neighbor and the, 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 you know, 
the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Right? These are in the opening sentences of the old rites of the Holy Eucharist that I, that I celebrate. More importantly, it's in Matthew. <laughs> so, uh, um, the personal benefit to me, to me, is immediately seen. How do I predispose my own soul such that my desire is to forever encourage proper desire in myself? So, um, let, let, let me take you to Jesus before you totally tune me out. Blessed are the hungry. This is probably the, the, the closest I'm going to get. Eros is not in the New Testament as a word. But this starts hinting at what I'm trying to describe as the, the world, the, the cosmology of Eros, so to speak. Okay? Blessed are the hungry. That's personal desire. I'm hungry. And I get to be blessed because I'm hungry. Blessed are the hungry. Happy are the hungry. That's personal desire. Blessed are the thirsty. But but let's also cut to the chase with Jesus here for a a brief moment. Jesus also said, blessed are the merciful. Merciful. Is there anything more selfish than hunger? I just mean, I mean, selfish in the bad way. I need to meet my body's needs. But it's self-oriented. I'm gonna go feed. I'm gonna go feed Nate. Take care of Nate. Um, so that, that seems self-oriented. But is there anything more selfless than offering mercy? And both are covered in the Beatitudes, right? Um, is there anything more selfless than offering mercy undeserved? The self-interested soul would demand reparations and recompense, right? That would that would be the self-interested soul, and not mercy. Mercy offers something undeserved. A disinterested soul would be the kind of soul to offer mercy, right? Um, And yet, how does Jesus end that beatitude? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So it comes back. The self-interest is there. And I I mean the good self-interest, which is to say... (laughs) Do you want mercy? If you do, then you have self-interest. I want mercy. That's how I preach to my congregation. I do not want to atone for my own sins. I want mercy, mercy, mercy. I want it. I am self-interested along the lines of mercy. I am self-interested in mercy. So how do I get there? Well, to put it crudely, By unselfishly offering mercy to others, I selfishly gain mercy for myself. And when you do that, you glorify God as the mercy giver. You glorify the cross as your mercy conduit. You merit mercy. Sorry, I got this kid at school who, this teacher, who hates the prayer book language around merits. By the merits of thy son, Jesus is like, there's no merit. You know, it's really weird. Mm-hmm. Um, you merit mercy for your own soul, not of your own making, and then you offer the same benefits to the God-imaged human beside you. So because of Jesus, everyone wins, including yourself. Yourself, yourself, yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. All right, now let's define it from Peeper. Eros, <clears throat> here is some sophisticated language around Eros. This Greek word, writes Pieper, which has been taken into all European languages, is far more ambiguous than it is usually expressed to be. He's saying it's not all about sex. From even a casual reading of the Platonic dialogues, we begin to see how wide its range of meaning is. Affection kindled by physical beauty, intoxicated God sent madness, thea mania. The impo- that's, that's what I want for my kids. Such intoxication with God that they're wild in their desire for God, right? Thea mania. That's what I should have named it. The Amani. This talk. Uh, he continues, the impulse to philosophical contemplation of the world in existence. 
philosophy is eros. I, I love that. Um, look at the relationship between the two there. He continues, the exaltation that went with the contemplation of divine beauty. How many times do you know Mr. Beauty in this, his opening sentence? His compound complex opening sentence? Beauty, beauty, beauty. So beauty is our theme. Beauty will save the world, right? Plato calls all of these things eros, all of them. That's how he gets you. In Sophocles, think Antigone, moreover, the word is used to mean approximately passionate joy. Passionate joy. We'll get there as well. And the fact that this passage introduces into the very meaning of eros, the essential relationship of love and joy, love and joy, eros is love, love and eros, is an achievement that should never be forgotten or lost. How might you, you want joyful kids? Plato, who looms overwhelmingly in the Christian tradition, um, says you ha- you're going to have to include some eros. So, so pause. I've not forgotten about our agape. We will get to that. I know, I know, 1 John 4.18, which says, he who fears is not perfected in love. I'm just saying that with eros as part of the overall strategy, we can get there. I might even say that a lot of Christian school, Christian school that I grew up in is in flight from eros. They're so suspicious of what might be awakened by a strategy of beauty. That was my Christian school, a little more fundamentalist, right? A little more um, oriented towards truth as worldview boot camp. That's the, there are sweet aspects of that in my school. I mean, it sounds like I'm like beating up on that or something, right? It's not that. I'm just trying to introduce more things to the conversation. I'm just trying to let's not be reductive. Let's be a little more inclusive of the greater and larger tradition. I think it's, anything that is the mere product of reducing everything of which which you find finally suspicious or unmanageable in your classroom doesn't leave you with a whole lot. Like you're going to have to, it's going to be a bit wild. Not everything's going to be safe. It's going to be a little, so, so don't be, don't be overly safe with these wild little creatures that we call children in your classroom and in your strategies, or they will grow suspicious of the overall Christian tradition themselves. Like, apparently, what they'll sense from you is suspicion. And then they'll think, oh, what protects and guards the Christian tradition is suspicion. Oh, okay, so if I'm going to be a part of this Christian tradition, I need to lie, I live a life of suspicion and, and, and sort of creep around suspiciously through life. So then they're going, to think, they're going to figure out real fast, like, am I, am I part of the protectorate of the suspicious tradition? Or is that even of interest to me? And my guess is they're going to they're going to choose indifference. Acedia, right? I just don't have the energy to spend the next 84 years of my life just pro- predominantly being suspicious of everything. Like, I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. And what they think they're out on is the Christian faith, when really they're, they're, they're just out on this reductive, I, I don't know, fragment of uh, an unbelievably amazing and rich tradition. So, so I, anyway, all that blah, 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 to say... I think we are in flight from Eros, and we are using sex as the vehicle for the flight. I think we're in flight from Eros. We're running the other direction. It's too wild. It's too unmanageable. It doesn't doesn't fit behind barbed wire, the barbed wire of my pedagogy. Of I can handle this. I can handle that. And we're and we as a culture. I, now I'm speaking to the larger culture. We as a culture are using sex as the vehicle for the flight. And, and, uh, and have even mechanized, of course, sex in, in the process. So we'd, we're not even able to write, I, I like, give me a love poem that's illicit, um, that at least is attempting to describe the movement of the soul any day of the week. Like, I'll, even, I'll even wade into it if, if it's about your mistress with my kiddos, nail biter, right? But the mere, me- we don't even, we, we're not writing about that anymore because sex has now been mechanized. So even, Set, we're using sex as a vehicle for, uh, to depart from the very thing that used to be the sweeping um, story of all. The, the whole mystique of the thing used to get us there. And uh, Anyway, ah, so I, maybe that's just we, with me, but that occurred to me when I wrote this. Like, dude, 
That's crazy. But David, Eros, the root word of erotic, is the thing we're running for from? And we're using sex to run from erotic? No way. So, so and just saying some of that reminds me of St. Paul's brief. Well, I'm going to skip over that. that. That is no longer probably needed. So, let us return to the fundamentals of love for a second. It is good that you exist. That phrase is all over paper. It is good that you exist. It is good that you exist. The instinct of Eros, it is good that you exist. It is good that you are in this world. Those are quotes from Peeper. It's good that you exist. It's good that you are in this world. This is love's first instinct toward anything that God has created, especially the sentient and animate things of this world like our fellow humans. Love testifies to the being in agreement, the, the, be, the assenting, the consenting, the applauding, the affirming, the praising, the glorifying, the hailing of all things created. That's the goal of education. I want you or I want it to exist. I want to praise you, applaud you, affirm you, praise you, glorify, hail, consent, assent, agree, agree. I want you to exist or I want it to exist. Loving is therefore a mode of willing. I want you to exist. Love and the, the, the snowman soul always comes back to mind. Passions are on the bottom. That's the big snowball at the bottom. Share that with the animals, right? Okay, there's your, there's your big snowball on the bottom of the soul snowman, so to speak. Middle ball is uh, mind, will, mind, will, mind, will, and then the affections are the head. And you need it to be in that order to get it right. Um, right? You put the middle ball and you start, you put the big ball on top, it falls over. That's what America does. Like, ah, yeah, the passion's on top. That's going to make a ton of sense. Um, so you got to get the, the three, the tripartite soul in order. Little ball, big ball, uh, middle ball, big ball. Heart, ruling over mind, will, ruling over passions. It's the ordered snowman of the soul. Um, and uh, oh, I was talking about will. Love and will. We, right, we, I, I fear that in the, the bootstrap culture of um, the American spirit, which makes a lot of sense to me, like I'm, I'm that guy, accidentally divorces uh, or separates uh, will power from the affect, from the heart. So I'm just trying to marry those up again by using Peeper's language, which is to say, it is good that you exist. So I'm I'm willing your existence because of my deep and great affection for you. It is good that you are in this world. Love is the purely affirmative assent to what already is, and it activates your will and your love. I want you to continue to exist. I'm going to find ways for you to continue to exist. I mean, this is a parenting instinct. I want you to exist because I love you. Um, love is the purely affirmative assent to what already is without um, some immediate uh, future tension. But what is it all going to mean? So you don't have the future tension. It's just good that you're here. It's good that you're here right now. It's good that you exist. I want you to exist. The purely affirmative assent. It is good that you exist. It. it it's devoid of past resentment in its purest form. So it's not worried about where the future's headed. It's just good that you exist. Eros has that interesting cyclic. It's always, it always feels like I want to be next up forever. You're always getting back in line, back in line for more, back in line for more. Back, and it's that sense when you see your spouse. Okay. It is a scent. And it is this a scent. And it, you can see how critical the, this kind of predisposition is toward your students each day, apart from any content that you seek to teach. So you just start with them. It's just good that they exist. Then you'll get to the, it's good that it exists of your content. It's just good that you exist. But you can, um, you can also see that the ascent toward the human, I want you to exist, can pave the way for their own ascent towards, let's say, algebra. I taught algebra for years. 
Can you imagine the day when a student says, I want algebra to exist. I agree with it. I assent to it. I applaud it. I affirm it. I praise it. I glorify it. And I hail it. It's very easy to conceive of my daughter, my senior daughter, she's about to turn 18, saying all those things about her boyfriend. We had to figure out boyfriends this year. I'm like, you have a, excuse me? What's his name? Uh, and how quickly can I expel him from our school? And she's like, wow, his mom is your chief financial officer and controller for the whole school. I was like, oh my gosh, Irina. Lori's kid. Anyway, she, she works for me. But Can you imagine the day when a student, instead of merely talking about their boyfriend, says about algebra, I agree with it. I want algebra to exist. I assent it, applaud it, affirm it, praise it, glorify it, hail it. I desire to properly desire algebra as a good in this world. Good because it exists. Good because it exists for my good. Good because it glorifies God. Eros is the love that paves the way for a desire for the good of algebra. It is the first step toward contemplative love and assent and passionate joy, Plato 101, okay? So, I should probably give you an example. I've, I've been very definitional, very... Uh, very heady here for a second. Um, I gave a really solid boyfriend example, I feel like. I feel like that was really good. Feet boots on the ground, boyfriend example. Dude, parenting. Um, but that's, that's what we're reaching for. Can you imagine, right? You no longer have to appeal to your student because something is useful. We like usefulness. We like the practical arts. We like, we like Plato. We like Aristotle. We've, we've all got that painting hanging in nine places in our school. So, yes, all of you sweet, will, power oriented, turn your homework in when I say sweet pea educators. You are vindicated in Thomas Aquinas, who writes, It is true that the will is a striving force, says St. Thomas. You are correct. Obey already, student of mine. Obey, obey. But he continues, but the will, he writes in the next sentence, knows not only the act of striving. That's kind of what I want. Just strive already. This should matter. For the, the, the will knows not only the act of striving for what it does not yet have, but also the other act of loving what it already possesses and rejoicing in that. So if you love what is already possessed, that activates the will in the proper way. You want your will to be activated by love. So if you reflect on what already exists, what already has been given, the goodness of God, the, the goodness of the one holy and undivided trinity, all the gifts that he's given his church, the promises, the means of grace, the hope of glory, as that other prayer book prayer says, of loving what, or, what is already possessed, rejoicing in that, you can then awaken that love, that love that is desire, to will for the thing not yet understood. It's hard to will the thing. To, like algebra just doesn't look fun. So you got to start. So I want to give you an example of that. Um, one leads to the other, right? Loving what you already possess, rejoicing in that, says Thomas Aquinas, leads to a will that becomes a striving force. And it becomes a striving for us because it's fed by love instead of by bootstrap willpower. Like, I'm going to, I'll show you. I'll show you, world. Um, I want them to be led by love. So you must first teach a child to love what is if you are ever to inspire the loving will that leads to sacrificial striving. Agape. That's how we get to agape. Then they will self-sacrifice. Then they will self-sacrifice. Okay. Oh, the times I've sat. So my, my two adoptive children, I had six kiddos. So five and six were adopted. And five had unbelievable trauma. Uh, uh, we, so we got them at six months. And uh, just the sheer number of, of broken bones alone. We won't get into all of that. But he's a very broken child. And he deals with a lot of latent 
reactive attachment disorder uh, type issues and trauma and all of the self-deluded stuff that comes with that. Ezra is everything to me. But Ezra is a very complicated, very, very complicated child. Um, oh, the times that I have told the most tormented little child in my life who leans toward the kind of disobedience all day, every day that shows his forfeiture, really due to the self-exhausting nature of his own inner life and the life of his mind. His self-doubt is palpable. Um, he just wasn't born with any of the instinctual um, and known and experienced love of attachment, right? He's a rad kid. Rad kids are very different kids, I believe. Now, and yet his mercy for the suffering is a Mount Everest compared to my Mount Scott. Mount Scott is the tallest mountain in Oklahoma. <laughs> it's down by Lawton, and it is not tall. You can see around it. You can walk all the way to the top in 48 minutes or less. His mercy for the suffering is a Mount Everest next to my Mount Scott. So I hold him accountable for his sin, but when my little Ezra disobeys for the 84th time, the first conversation that we have, even before corrective action, is this. Every time you have to, is this. This is my example of St. Thomas Aquinas. I, by the way, I don't always do this. I'm not right. So I don't mean all the time. I just remembered a time that <laughs> that's a joke. I don't always do this. This is when I'm in a good place. This is not after the 14th phone call of the day uh, about uh, my personal response to vaccine mandates. That's when my heart has left my body and then I'm terrible with my children. I'm like, ah, okay. So, so uh, I say, Ezra, so we're sitting on his bed, right? Ezra, whose bed is this, right? You start with what is already possessed. Whose bed is this? Who's one, he has this bookshelf where he collects all of the books, right next to his bed. It's totally trashed. This is the most disorganized human being I've ever met. It's great. He, he knows where all of it is. It's his brain file, right? Whose 100 books are those? Whose godmother picked him up for ice cream yesterday? Who went to pick out new shoes last week with mom? Whose daddy just drove to Colorado for one fishing trip last week? Uh, who is loved because he is lovely? Who gave this day to shine upon the obedient and the disobedient? Um, and he knows, and he's drawn to me in those moments. He slowly scoots closer. Like it's a, it has a drawing effect. I, we have scientifically proven this in our family. So he scoots closer and we reawaken the knowledge of what is already lovely before I can even begin to awaken in him the will to strive for what is good and to choose something other than uh, disobedience. And he's a, he's a fun disobedient. Like he just has clever ways of disobeying that I'm like, dude, that was solid. I was so much dumber at disobeying. So he, his, reminded, his reminded self-love, I just start with he's loved. And he understands that language a lot. And it, it takes him a while to get there. It's not instinctual for him. It's not instinctual for rad kids. Immediately leads to his ability to lovingly care for others. To loving, which is the only purpose of obedience anyway. Right, I'm going to get to that in a minute. Man, the way parents misuse obedience. But obedience is to lovingly respond to a mother because of an awakening of desire to love your mom. Like, that's what I'm actually after. That's what my, mom, my wife's actually after. Like, obedience is not an inner checklist. And so... Um, yes, your students should obey you, educators. You, of course, they should, of course. But make sure that you weight your moral authority in the same kind of way that God deals with you. What does God say before the Ten Commandments? It's a reminder of what is already possessed. It's my whole point. It's Thomas Aquinas' whole point. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. He starts with what's already possessed. The promises have already been made good. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So promise always precedes command. That's the biblical narrative. Uh, you don't offer the command, tempt the failure, and then throw your hands up and be like, clearly you don't believe the promises of God. Which is how Christian parenting works so often. Demand the thing, basically provoke the failure, 
And, um, and then throw your hands up and be like, clearly you don't believe the promises of God. Promise always precedes commandment in Scripture. The Red Sea precedes Sinai. Is the other way to say it. Like, it is tempting as a parent to use obedience as a convenience to your own failures in loving patience. Sometimes I want it done because I want it done and not because anything moral is actually on the line. So do not be spiritually abusive in your use of obedience in the name of your moral and instructive authority. Not everything that you want at this exact moment needs to carry the entire moral authority of do not murder. Um, do you follow? So this is hard. So this, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give some parenting confessions here. If Ezra is banging his pencil, this child will bang anything. Like, do we just need to get you the drum set in the backyard, in a cave, behind a steel door, in another? I'm just kidding. If Ezra's banging his pencil on the counter to the annoyance of all of 38th Street, that's where I live, he's not breaking a moral rule. He's just drumming his pencil like the kid has ticks. I got a whole page of ticks, right? So instead of just demanding stop and then carrying him off for time out if he immediately doesn't, I use my, at least once out of every 10 times, bank account of loving patience toward him and say, Ezra, do you mind rolling your pencil in your hands or banging it on your pants? Can't hear your pants, can hear the counter. Give the kid a choice. He doesn't need to think that God is the kind of being who designs petty rules for arbitrary reasons and then punishes us when we miss the clues of his own annoyance as the great deity. Like, you don't want to present God as the, the great annoyed one um, because you, because I'm not a good dad. I don't, want to be that, I, don't, I don't want to be that guy. I am going to be that guy. That's why I plead mercy. Have you heard the mercy? I want mercy. I do not want to atone for my own sins with my kids. A damaged amygdala, which is what we think has happened to him, my, my baby. A damaged amygdala will hear every hurried, petty, and patience-lacking command as a return to their fight or flight. They just, they, that's where they go immediately. I once yelled, honor, the AJR kid, his older brother. Honor, once at home when Ezra first came to us. And he immediately started banging his head against a wooden bookshelf, trying to knock himself out before torture once again returned. And he just immediately started, and I thought, oh my God. So Ezra's a sinner. Oh my gosh. I'm a worse sinner, but love is patient. Everything is mercy. And as I stated at the beginning of this talk, mercy on your part is only for your benefit. You offer mercy. Be merciful so that you yourself are shown mercy. So, um, let me jump ahead. That's just an example of, I try, wanted to give you a good example I, from my own life of reawaken what is already possessed, to awaken love, and what love once again feels like. Then walk with a child to, of course, how you want their will to be properly disposed toward love for mom and obedience to her. You're not always going to have time for that. I, I, this is not a parenting talk. Though. Oh my gosh, I'm so tempted to be like, oh man. Okay. Let's make a few more connections. Love, and we'll land this plane in six minutes. Oh yeah, we're there. We are there. Okay. Maybe there'll be a, a couple minutes for reflections from you guys. Love is often experienced as a continual, affirmative, Keeping the beloved in existence. It is good that you exist. It is good that you exist. That's a quote from people. It's not my quote. Certainly that is our experience of the beloved of God. We exist because God's love says we exist. That's it. God hath no need of us, or we would step very quickly into the worst kind of heresy. We continue to exist because God's eternal love says that we exist forevermore. It is the nature of love. The parent experiences this. I mean, my children still exist, you might say, because of a love that a mom has in self 
sacrificing daily for their continued existence in this world. They are loved because they are lovable, and they are lovable because they are loved. We desire their existence, and that same desire for their existence leads us over time to self-sacrifice, which is what my wife does every day. She works out of the home. She works in the home. I, 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 right, and, and on, and all of you, and all of us, and all those things. Um, I, I just can't say that without thinking of my wife. There's agape. There it is. A contemplation of their good, eros, leads to a love of self-sacrifice, like that of a mom, like that of an educator. The unselfish kind of love that we call the agape. First, it is good that you are. That's the first instinct. How wonderful that you exist. The most marvelous of all things a being can do is just be, just to be. That's Ariel. It's just good that you're here, that you're here. A ravishing, passionate joy of desiring and loving the good that already is. And what does that self-interested love lead to? Self-sacrifice, agape. It is God who in the act of creation anticipated all conceivable human love and said, I will you to be. It is good. It is good. It is very good that you exist. It is very good, he says. This explains even the first stirrings of love, which contain an element of gratitude. And this is where I'll end. Gratitude is the first reply of Eros. Gratitude has a, an outward orientation. So this already shows you're at great risk with eros, going to be self-interested, and yet the first instinct is gratitude that the other exists. So the self-interested nature of eros leads to an outward other's orientation. It's, my, it's not my thesis, it's Peeper. I'm just, I just repackage Peeper with a little AJR, a little dash. Gratitude is the first reply of eros. I am grateful that you exist, that it exists. I am grateful that algebra exists. So what takes place in human love is a continuation and perfecting of what was begun in creation. God planted this whole seed. Shocker. It is your job as teachers to flame that love for everything. And I've given you examples of how I've tried to do that with my own children and my own students and so on. There are liturgies written across the classical and Christian world of how to begin with what is known, work towards what is unknown. I've read the John Milton Gregory book as well. What I'm trying to say is it's more than a, a tactical strategy um, in, a, in, in, in only the logos sense. I'm trying to take us to, uh, to pathos, via eros, whatever. Uh, you, you, you see there. It is your job as teachers to flame that love for everything. And it might kill you, by the way. It's going to wear you out because we all including your students. What do we actually just want to be loved for our cleverness, our beauty, our generosity, our fairness, and our usefulness. But Eros is lovingly and breathlessly shocked that you simply exist in the first place, regardless of how clever you may or may not be. Eros is pumped. You just are. That you just are. I cannot believe something as good as algebra. Um, okay, I'll leave it there so that there's some time for questions or response. Bless you. Okay, what have I, what have I left out that you were hoping to hear? Like, ah, wow, that got me 38% of the way there, Nate. Tell me, um, any reflections or do you agree? You can disagree by the way, like, yeah, well. Okay, okay. Okay, good. Good. Oh my gosh. That's so tough. And it's good that we we praise God and remind him how much they love. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the practices? Um, liturgies of the classroom that you think either help students to lead towards this kind of proper love towards the subjects or inhibit it 
you think there's some specific? Sure. Um, so, uh, 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 in fact, I, that's w one place that I land. Um, here are a few reflections on that, and then let me answer it in, in a more liturgical sense. So what are we to do with the academic blueprints? This is my final paragraph. Nate, you got these blueprints that are you showed to an accreditor once upon a time. Proof, we do stuff. See what we do, we do stuff. Knowledge is best communicated by love, and for children you need to start with desire. Blueprints are an approximation of the should be loved knowledge. The should be loved, the should be loved. That's all you're doing. What's a blueprint? What's an academic, the should be loved? It's not the delivery tool. I'm speaking to the, to the delivery tool here. If you don't love the subject, neither will they. Because knowledge is best communicated by love. So keep your humor about you. That's tactic number one. Um, God laughs even at his enemies, which keep, keeps him in loving and proper relationship with his enemies. Which is very good news since all of us, I think, are friends by virtue of faith and baptism. So knowledge is best communicated by love. He certainly laughed when he created you. So keep humor as a part of love's outworking. Love your students. Love the A students that do it all in silence. Love the students who would live in detention if we offered it. Love the judgmental, law-abiding Pharisees and the profane. Peter was both. Love form and love content. Some people love the process and disparage the content. Some love the book and are horrible teachers. Love both. Strive for both. Say prayers with your babies. That is absolutely critical. It's the loving ex exhale of all Christian discipleship. Prayers to show loving. Um, exhale for the needs in your classroom. And if you pray for your children and for the needs, even if it's the dumbest thing you've ever heard, they feel cared for. Um, it's the loving exhale of all Christian discipleship. You're hosed without prayer. You need to love love. You need to love love's ability to perpetuate more love. You need to love the discipleship moments that take you away from content delivery. You just own it. You need to love the kid right when he disobeys. Love the kid in the course of discipleship. Love the kid the moment his or her discipline is complete. Remember that the father anxiously awaited the return of his reprobate and prodigal son. So we, a lot of what I'm saying is your kids are going to watch you. And if you are predisposed to love, um, I, you know, the worst kid in your class and the very brightest kid in your class, both of which have unbelievable sins they're carrying into that classroom, right? One's going to be tempted towards. Um, it actually paved the way for me to be a beloved math teacher using a content that only... 20% of my students even give two hoots about. Was, so leading with love and deep interest in the child seems to pave the way for the content delivery that you otherwise have to point at at the end. You're like, dude, I did something. Content, content. Uh, lots of prayers. Uh, uh, and I probably should stop there because I'm out of time. It, just remember that the the... the, the the father anxiously awaited the return of his reprobate and prodigal son. He was pumped to find him. The son broke every rule. He spent all the money. The capital's gone. He's in debt. You're going to have to pay that crap off. He was welcomed back with restorative love even before he offered his apology. So he's in the middle of, I am no more worthy to be called thy son. That's a fun Lenten sentence for morning prayer. Come on, come on. Mm -hmm. I am no more worthy. And, and before he can get to the end of the sentence, the father says, kill the fatted calf. Right? Um, mere function will fail you in the classroom. The fact that it works is not as impressive as it once was uh, to children. And so, because they're no longer battling uh, they're battling disinterestedness. And so I'm just trying to move the tactical plane a little bit. It's a new battle. Um, Okay, what else? Any other questions? Okay, God bless you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> I hope this helps. <laughs>